now uh, our keynote speaker is Professor George Borjas, Robert W. Screener Professor of Economics and Social Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. Professor Borjas is the author of several books, including Immigration Economics, or Heaven's Door, Immigration uh, Policy. So, Mr. Borjas, the floor is yours, please. I want to thank the organizers uh, of the conference for inviting me. It's a real honor to be able to be here uh, among so many distinguished people and speakers uh, about the immigration issue, uh, which is really, it is really one of the biggest challenges of our time. And secondly, before I start, I also want to sort of like point out that I'm a little humbled and uh, intimidated by the fact I'm following the speakers uh, that came before me who clearly are major political figures and all I really do in my life is be a professor teaching a class, look at a computer screen and run data and it's quite a different experience. In any case, uh, what I want to talk about is the economic impact of immigration and let me tell you um, the way economists usually think about this. I call that the economistic perspective. The, when you talk, and talk to an economist about immigration, the first reaction they have is that immigration is like trade. It's really no different from trade at some fundamental level. Uh, when, we import, when we have free trade or we have trade between countries, we import and export widgets, right? Well, immigration is like that, except that instead of importing the finished product, we're importing the people who can produce that finished product domestically. And that's really the only difference between the, two, between the two things at some fundamental level. If once you buy into that way of thinking about immigration, then all the costs and benefits from immigration accrue during the time the immigrants spend on the assembly line. They produce widgets and things come out of that and there are costs of that and there are benefits from that and that's basically uh, the way that we think, that economists think about this. They, once you think of it in that very narrow way, immigration has no other impact on culture, on society, or anything else like that, because it's just producing widgets, and it's just like trade. Decades, in fact, centuries of economy, economic thinking has taught us that trade is good. So once you buy into that way of thinking, it must follow that immigration is good, because immigration is like trade. Uh, that's a very narrow and incorrect way of thinking about immigration, I think. And the way I want to sort of point out how wrong it is, is by looking at a quote. Uh, Max Frisch, who's a Swiss writer, who used to be a Swiss writer, uh, he uh, was observing the German experience in the 50s and 60s with the immigration of many guest workers into Germany. And he observed and made what I think is the smartest thing anybody has ever said about immigration, which is that quote in bold in the slide. We wanted workers, but we got people instead. In other words, the perception of immigrants as just robotic workers is incorrect because immigrants are not widgets. Immigrants are people. And the fact that immigrants are human beings and not robotic workers has many repercussions. And those repercussions could either make the benefits from immigration greater, or they could make the cost of immigration later, depending on the context and on the time period. And just to give you an idea of what I mean by how things change in, about thinking about immigration once you allow for the fact that immigrants are human beings, just look at the following few examples, okay? One of the things that economists sort of discover very quickly when you look at data on immigration is the fact that not everybody migrates. Most people stay where they are. And only a select few migrate. And the people who choose to leave are different from the people who choose to stay. We have a phrase for that. Immigrants are self-selected. And that basically means that the people who choose to leave may not necessarily be the people the country wants to get or needs from a labor market point of view. A second issue is that immigrants choose to assimilate. I mean, assimilation is not an automatic, universal thing that everybody goes through. Assimilation requires investments. We call that human capital investments. It requires learning English. It requires, in the US context, 
It requires moving around, looking for a city where the jobs are available. It requires all kinds of, of costs that immigrants have to incur. And many people might decide it's not worth it, depending on the context. Immigrants, unlike widgets, wear ethnic labels, as many Europeans will know. And ethnicity matters, and it matters for a very long time. It has a major culture on social impact. Looking at immigrants as widget makers completely misses that. And last but not least, immigrants have lives outside the factory gate. Once they finish producing widgets for the day, they go out and have a life. And like every human being, all kinds of things happen when you leave the factory. You know, and so people get sick, for example. So there's an interaction between immigration and the welfare state. And that is why the, economist, the economics, economistic perspective of looking at immigrants as sort of robotic workers is just wrong. We need to expand the perspective. And what I want to do is show you in three different, in, in a couple of different contexts, how, that, how expanding that provides a much more nuanced way of thinking about the, the costs and benefits from immigration. So let me talk first about assimilation. And this is a graph, I'm going to show you a few graphs. This is a graph that shows you the rate at which immigrants learn English in the US. And the red, the orange line is a 75, 79 cohort. In other words, this is the rate at which the immigrants who arrive in the late 70s learn English. The bottom two lines are, is the rate at which the immigrants who arrive in the late 80s or late 90s learn English. This is a graph from the National Academy of Sciences. They produced a report a couple of years ago, three years ago now, and I just took the data and graphed it. So you can sort of see what it looks like. And one thing you can tell from this graph is different immigrant waves have different rates of assimilating. You know, and in fact, it's very clear that the more recent waves don't learn English at the same rate as the earlier waves. When you look at this in a more historical context, one thing you see very quickly is that the immigrants who tend to assimilate quicker tend to come in periods where immigration is not a very large phenomenon. The immigrants who assimilate slower tend to come in periods where there's a very large scale immigration going on. And the reason for that is that ethnicity matters and ethnic enclaves matter. This is showing you the rate of learning English over the first 10 years as, a, as you know, related to how large the ethnic enclave is. You know, larger enclaves, if you are in, in a group that has very large ethnic enclaves in the US, the necessity for investing in learning in English is not as, is not as important. You know, you can basically live your whole life in an enclave. You can read, you know, that, la that enclave's language newspaper. You can get jobs within the enclave. And the necessity for sort of learning the language of the overall economy lessens. So it's, it's, not, it's not that immigrants are doing this on purpose. It's just that the economic incentives any of us faced with that situation would do exactly the same thing. You have to invest to acquire human capital. Why bother if you don't need it? And that's basically one of the lessons of looking at immigration uh, as a assimilation, as a decision that immigrants make. The second thing I want to look at is the fiscal impact. You know, immigrants do get sick, and immigrants, their children go to school, and all kinds of things happen. Plus, they pay taxes. So it actually could be pretty good for the country, right? Well, again, the National Academy produced a report a, few, a couple of years ago where they estimated the fiscal impact of admitting one immigrant today over the next 75 years, okay? So you basically track that immigrant over 75 years and find out what happens, how much do they add in terms of taxes versus costs, and those are the numbers. They did a whole bunch of scenarios, so all I did here was summarize the range. On average, it all depends on the scenario. I mean, it just, you know, you have to make all kinds, just imagine the exercise, right? You're predicting the world and how immigrants do over 75 years. So there's a million assumptions. You vary the assumptions, you get different answers. But what's really clear is that depending, that no matter what scenario you look at, high school immigrants tend to contribute positively to the fiscal, you know, the, to the fiscal bottom line. Low skill immigrants don't. So again, depending on which kind of immigrants content coming to the country, it really matters as to what the net fiscal impact will be. And last but not least, immigrants are workers, okay? 
And, uh, you know, they, there's a quote from Paul Samuelson, if you've heard of the name, a very famous economist. After World War I, laws were passed limiting immigration. Only a trickle of immigrants were admitted by 64, which is true. And by keeping labor supply down, immigration policy keeps wages high. Something is supply and demand. The, price of, the supply of oil goes up, the price of gas goes down. Every economist admits to that in the gasoline business. In the immigration context, that statement is highly disputed. So what I want to show you is uh, basically some estimates as to what the labor market impact is. And it all depends on which group you belong to. Again, this is a range here, so you can sort of see the numbers in the short run, long run. Immigration in the US over the last 30, 40 years has been disproportionately low skill. And it is the low skill workers who've paid for that, basically. It is their wage that has been reduced the most. But at the same time, don't forget that somebody's wage reduction is somebody else's higher profit. Immigrants do produce widgets, and widget makers' wages will go down. But widget producers' profits will go up. So what, you, what economists do is sort of add up all these things together and try to calculate what the impact of immigration is on the whole economy. So, there's no doubt about the fact that if you net out the fiscal impact, immigrants increase the size of the economic pie. And they increase it, if you look at the first row there, by like $2 trillion. You know, 2104.0 billion, so it's $2 trillion. But most of that increase in the pie goes to immigrants themselves. You know, they have to get paid. They don't produce wages for free. They get paid, and they get paid most of that. So the immigration surplus, which is what natives get to keep out of that, it's only 50 billion, which is a lot of money, but in the scheme of the US economy, which has like an $18 trillion GDP, it's not that big a deal. What's a real big deal is the last two rows, which is redistribution. Native workers lose, native firms gain. In another way of putting it is this, if you compete with immigrants, you tend to lose out. But if you use immigrants, you tend to gain. And of course, immigrants gain a lot. The salary they're making by producing widgets way exceeds what they would have made in their, in their, in their original country. Once you think of it this way, you can sort of see that immigration benefits some people, is painful to other people, it might increase the economic pie if you've put aside the fiscal impact, and uh, the question then becomes, is what do you do? What does immigration policy accomplish? What, what, what should immigration policy accomplish? And the answer is really much more of a value judgment than most economists care to admit. Because not everybody gains. Any particular immigration policy you choose is basically making a choice as to which group you want to favor. You know, different policies will favor workers. Different policies will favor the firms. Different policies will favor immigrants. So the real, the, the, the key question in immigration is really who are you rooting for? Because that determines the kind of policy that the country should pursue. Thank you very much.